This episode is sponsored by our friends over at Keeps. John Mayer and Audemars Piguet just released one of the most amazing watches I've seen in a very, very long time. And there's so much to talk about with this new watch, this new complicated, precious, unique Royal Oak, limited Royal Oak. And I'm going to unbox all of all of it here today, right? We're going to talk about the watch itself and what it means, talk about its historical context, talk about Audemars Piguet as a brand and, and why or, or how they've captured such a, a unique opportunity and how they're the only ones really that could have done this. Um, and, and we're going to also compare this to another Audemars Piguet release that, that recently happened with a celebrity that I think was a dumpster fire. And, and we're going to really compare and contrast these things, right? Why did I right, take an analytical view to why did John Mayer's collab work so well? And the other, um, I think, was a, was a disaster, right? What's the difference? And a lot of it comes down to honesty, sincerity, and intelligence. So we're going to end off a little bit of history about the Royal Oak and its designer, Gerald Genta, with the watch on my wrist here. This is an incredible watch that you're going to want to see up close. So stay tuned until the end of today's discussion for, um, for that footage and that discussion. So let's get into uh, let's get into a whole lot. John Mayer has been a longtime fan and and collector of and you know really public advocate for Audemars Piguet. I actually don't think that there is another brand that John Mayer has worn as frequently. He's worn Audemars Piguet concepts and perpetual calendars and all different sorts of medals and uh, divers and offshores. John Mayer has been an absolute warrior for the brand and the public. And it's, I think it's been such a great relationship for so many reasons. And I'll list them off now in no particular order. A, just the nature of John Mayer's profession, right, being a guitar player, his wristwatch is on full display constantly. And, I mean, on these huge, huge, I was going to say televisions, but displays uh, in front of thousands and thousands of people. I've been to a John Mayer show and I couldn't stop looking at his wristwatch. And I know that while I'm a you know wristwatch guy and collector and lover, and maybe that's abnormal, there is no question that a, a disproportionate number of people uh, at those shows are aware of John Mayer's affinity towards wristwatches, and they see these wristwatches front and center, and probably just through, you know, kind of cultural awareness, they know that John Mayer is a big watch guy. That's just that's just a known thing, right? I, I can't tell you how many folks I've met that have no interest in watches, not really, right? Just a passing awareness. And if they know one thing, it's probably that John Mayer loves watches, right? And, and that's been through his Ardinky videos, that's been through his stuff on Instagram, like he's really brought watches into to kind of like in his universe and his brand image in the whole John Mayer culture. Okay, so let's fast forward. Like I said, not only is John Mayer a collector and lover of Audemars Piguet, but now he's taken on a new role as creative conduit. I don't really love the, the, the label there, but I love what it represents and I love what it is. Okay, so, so, so what have they done? They just recently released their first, of many, by the way, limited edition Audemars Piguet's that John Mayer has had a very significant role in the development of. They released a perpetual calendar in white gold with this new dial uh, a pattern and texture. Now, Audemars Piguet is pretty famous and I think like, you know, revered for their, you know, work with textures and dials and cases and materials like ceramic or carbon fiber, but even more interesting, you know, it's it's the it's the patterns and the and the finishes, right? From this hammered dial tourbillon to frosted cases and then mirror dials. Audemars Piguet definitely pushes the envelope and has really invested a lot of, I think, well spent resources on making their watches as, you know, different and 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 you know artistically explorative uh, in terms of finishing and materials, kind of as possible. I think they've done a really great job. In many ways, you know, they're so limited in the fact that their company is so reliant on one model being the Royal Oak, but their exploration of all these different materials and finishes, I think, has really made the most out of an over-reliant brand, right? Or really has made the most out of, out of that Royal Oak, right? It's not lazy like one might accuse the brand of being. So here's where it gets really interesting. The dial that they release, which they're calling the Crystal Sky, is A, beautiful, right? Which is a big part of, of, of the growth of the the watch hobby, right? Something needs to be 
obviously beautiful for the masses to really kind of get indoctrinated. The opposite, of course, would be like a really nuanced detail that you need to like really study to understand. Something like that would exist in the, in, in the vintage world, like, you know, a, a particular Bart Simpson Rolex logo or a Frog's Foot logo or an underline. You need to be a real watch guy to give a crap about that. Whereas, you know, just really any passerby can see this new crystal sky uh, dial and say, oh God, that's beautiful. And I think that that's really important important, right? Understanding the the levels of interest and what a brand needs to do to capture the attention of the masses, right? Not just the watch people. But beyond that, right? Audemars Piguet didn't stop at just kind of, you know, making something shiny and, you know, uh, catching the attention of the masses. They made something so interesting, something that's actually rooted not just in te technological supremacy, and we'll get into how these dials are made in a second, but also uh, history. The concept of these dials is rooted in, in good old-fashioned Audemars Piguet history. See, in the 1990s, Audemars Piguet released a dial variant, which was this, uh, this hand-hammered, you know, beautifully textured dial called the Tuscan dial. I believe the word Tuscan has been given by the collector community, not Audemars Piguet themselves, and it's come about because these watches were collected by a lot of Italian collectors. I have no evidence to support the idea that they were collected more by Italians than anybody else, but Italians are big, big watch collectors. The big watch collecting communities in the world that are famous are really the Italian watch collecting community and then the Japanese community as well. These are like two really, you know, kind of uh, legacy communities. But I digress. These watches are odd and rare and collectible. Most were manufactured in the 1990s, I believe. Uh, most manufactured in the perpetual calendar variation, which does make sense coming into modernity, seeing this dial reappear, albeit I think much improved, and these are actually more beautiful now, um, uh, again, in this perpetual calendar model. Now, these dials are not just technically impressive, right, in their process. I will read to you what Hodinkee wrote about it, but I I'm, and I'm not stupid, but I, I don't even understand what this really says, but I'll read it to you. The brass style plate is stamped by an electroformed die. I don't know what that is, which allows precision by building up the reverse of the intended dial design atom by atom. I mean, atom by atom, it seems like a very specific you know, metric here. I don't know if that's true. I guess it's true. Uh, giving a high accuracy and fine detail to the end result. Then the dial is PVD coated in a deep blue shade. Taking a step aside, I just think that these dial manufacturing processes are... I think it's much more compelling when you could just see it, right? I don't need to, I, I, I'm not really going to grasp exactly what all this means. And I don't think that words can really do justice to the average person because there's so much, you know, research that we need to go into understanding even the definitions of some of these words and the difficulties of their processes. Uh, I, I would love to see how this style was made. And I just haven't seen, I haven't seen content like that, but I'll get into the release in a second. Um, but also not just, again, the technical supremacy, but also, you know, just the beauty. These watches are beautiful. I think that they took the Tuscan dial idea and they added this kind of galactic element. It looks like the cosmos. It looks like outer space to a degree, a dramatic version, of course, but still, which I think may even be a reaction to the overwhelming success and acclaim that met the uh, the uh, perpetual calendar in the Code 1159 collection. That watch from day one of the Code 1159 release, which was not a great release, right? Everyone was kind of upset when it happened. That watch was always, right, the recipient, the benefactor of remarkable remarkable praise, right? Outrageous acclaim. So ba back, I think that it's just a great dial, right? I mean, let's, you know, I think it's a great dial. On the metal, released in white gold exclusively. Mwah, I love that, right? I love that they didn't, uh, I love that they resisted the urge to just make this another stainless steel sports watch. I'm so done with it in the uber luxury world. I watched a video recently of Kevin O'Leary you know, talking about his about his uh, uh, Audemars Piguet custom order uh, skeleton with the ruby bezel. And, you know, he was talking, and I think Kevin O'Leary's a you know, great watch collector and super cool guy, and God bless him. I, I really, I like him quite a bit. And, and God, you know, he's the one getting a custom Royal Oak made, not me. So, and it's, and it's a personal journey, and it's a personal decision, and all that stuff. So, he's not right or wrong, of course. But my view is, on his remarks, you know, his remarks were... Um, uh, he called Paul Boutros, who's a who's a uh, part of the Phillips auction house and the watch department. And Paul said, uh, down the line, um, the collectability of the stainless steel variant, as opposed to making it in platinum, uh, would make for you know it would just be demand more money, right? First of all, who gives a shit? Uh, you know uh, that's how I feel. You have so you, the point of money and buying things is to buy things that you prefer, right? That you buy things that regardless of anyone else, you 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 prefer. B, I actually don't necessarily think Paul Boutros is right. I don't I don't have an opinion one way or the other. I just think that 
I don't know. I just, I don't necessarily think he's right. Two more things. One, the precious metal is precious. I find it extremely comfortable, but I could see how a collector might say that the stainless steel is just lighter and nicer, and for him it's just better, and even though he knows it's not technically as good or as valuable, it's just it's just lighter and it's less you know cumbersome. I can understand that, um, but I love that John Mayer decided to kind of you know go against pop culture and go with precious metal. I also think it's funny that choosing precious metal is against pop culture, right? Because it should be the opposite. But you know, marketing minds uh, you know do amazing things to 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 people. Um, okay, limited to two hundred pieces, one hundred eighty thousand dollars. What do I think? I think that this is brilliant. I love that it's limited to 200 pieces. I think the dial is absolutely amazing. I think that the launch is great. I think that you couldn't have had a possibly better brand ambassador. This is a person that it loves the brand, absolutely loves the brand, couldn't be a better brand ambassador. And the watch is great. And the release was great. Totally unexpected. I don't like the word, the, the term creative conduit. Creative conduit to me feels like, uh, I don't know, it actually feels cheaper than, than the situation was, right? Like creative conduit for me, feels like, I don't know, this is, I don't know, I don't know. I just don't like it, okay? And you know what? A big part of uh, marketing is just kind of gut and feeling and uh, what does it taste like saying? And I don't like creative conduit. I just don't like it. Um, but I, I think that this is an amazing piece. And I think it's an amazing release. And I think it's so much better than the Travis Scott Cactus Jack release. Um, a, I, I believe it more. I believe that that John Mayer loves Audemars Piguet far more than I believe that Travis Scott loves Audemars Piguet. I have no evidence uh, to, I, I've, I've looked for content about him, you know, waxing poetic uh, and, you know, just loving Audemars Piguet. I found nothing. Uh, I just found nothing. Maybe his, maybe his deep education and passion for Audemars Piguet is closeted and he just doesn't like to talk about it. I don't think that's the case. I think that Audemars Piguet pulled kind of a, you know, classic and cheap trick, just trying to ride the coattails of a popular influencer, which I think is beneath them. And beyond my, and frankly, this is the a large part of the internet's, uh, uh, you know, feeling as well. Um, you know, beyond, we were suspicious that this was really just an attempt at Audemars Piguet to kind of just like reach this audience as opposed to like an opportunity for them or, or an example where they really collaborated deeply with someone that was a fan and, and, brilliant mind in this space, right, in, in, the, in the watch space as well. You know, the watch itself had no root in, in history. The watch itself was uninteresting and uninspired. Audemars Piguet did not invent anything new here. They did not push the boundaries. The only, you know, the only unprecedented thing they did was like literally co-brand the watch, which of all people, I can't put, I mean, John Mayer didn't put fucking continuum on the subdial of this watch, right? John Mayer has taste and John Mayer, uh, you know, understands, right, what is, what, it, what makes a smart watch, not a smart watch, but a smart watch, an intelligent watch, a watch that is a reflection of an understanding of, the, of, 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 of watchmaking, of history, right, of the brands, right? That's brilliant. That's brilliant, you know? Uh, so anyway, this John Mayer creative conduit thing is amazing. I have full confidence in John Mayer uh, to deliver <laughs> as many as he wants with, with you know, with you know, to perfection. I mean, I really feel that way. I think that he'll just kill it. You know, uh, he's, an, he's a watch nut. You know, he's obsessed. He's clearly intelligent and, um, and he's tasteful, right? Which is the final, you know, kind of the final pillar here. So great job to Audemars Piguet. Brilliant job. Brilliant job, John Mayer. I think this is a fantastic thing. And I think that this is very unique to Audemars Piguet. I don't think that, I know that neither of the other two Holy Trinity brands could have a situation like this. They're not culturally open enough to have this. This is only possible at AP. So congratulations uh, to them. But before we get into the next part of this great conversation, let's take a quick 60 second break and thank our sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness all from the comfort of their home. With Keeps, you can get clinically proven treatments that address hair loss and, and even boost hair regrowth delivered right to your door in discreet packaging. And it's so easy. All you need to do is complete an online consultation to get matched with a treatment plan tailored to you that addresses your hair loss concerns. You can find a plan that works for your schedule with a flexibility of three, six, and 12 
12-month delivery options, and you can adjust, pause, or cancel your plan at any time. I think the big beauty here of Keeps is, is not only the efficacy, but really convenience. You know, in today's day, uh, when we have so many things pulling us in different directions, having a convenient solution is everything. And yes, right, in this space, you want it to be discreet too. Having discreet packaging, at-home convenient delivery of clinically proven treatments, you can't beat it. According to their clinical studies, treatments offered by Keeps are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. That's why we've partnered with Keeps. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash Theo Harris or click the link in the description. That's keeps.com slash Theo Harris for your special offer. Head on over now. Thank you to Keeps. All right, back into Audemars Piguet. You know, the designer of the Royal Oak in 1972 was a man named Gerald Genta, Gerald Charles Genta. And that brings me to my wristwatch check. This is the Gerald Charles Ma uh, Maestro Squelette 8.0 in solid uh, rose gold with an amazing skeleton dial. I picked up this watch in December and I've been wearing it very regularly since. Uh, what really struck me, obviously, at first, well, there's a couple of things that are competing for first place here, but obviously this case design is so unique and interesting. The case design was inspired by Baroque architecture. Look at this building here that Gerald Genta and, uh, you know, looked at and took inspiration from. That's amazing. This man was an artist with just as much of a history in jewelry as in watchmaking, right? And a man that, keep in mind, if you really look at his 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 his, his collection over over his life, as soon as he separated from these big conglomerates and and did his own two brands, one being Gerald Genta and the second being Gerald Charles, just just a little while after, they were much more ornate pieces. You know what he what he did with uh, Audemars Piguet and what he did with Pet Philippe and what he did with IWC um, was was much more restrained, right? It was beautiful. They're great watches. They're brilliant, but it was more corporate. But these watches he made independently were, I feel, I feel far better reflections of the man himself uh, and his affinity for jewelry, right? It, kind of ornate design, right? Inspiration from architecture. The rubber strap here, which by the way is super comfortable, is inspired by uh, uh, French architecture, this Clou de Paris, he called it. Um, moving on from the case, which by the way is 100 meters water resistant, which really surprised me, but it's the proportions that blow me away. And the proportions are just perfect. Um, it is not a surprise because Gerald Genta designed it, um, but they're perfect. It's 39 millimeters in diameter and 8.35 millimeters in thickness. Um, this is just, it's flaw, it's flawless. It's a flawless case. And these watches are not just offered in the skeleton variant, even though it's a mind-blowing watch. Also in a chronograph, in a left-hand version, in a time only. This is a, a pretty big collection, um, uh, but a decisive collection, a beautiful collection. This watch is truly one of the most comfortable and elegant watches in its class. And really, when you're talking about in its class, what are we talking about? I would I would say that this watch's direct competitors would be uh, Patek's uh, Aquanaut in rose gold. Um, obviously, you know, the Royal Oak Chrono on a strap. These are the watches that I would pick against each other and compare and contrast. Um, but what makes this watch just completely, in my opinion, head and shoulders better, uh, strong word, but I really feel that way, is the dial here, the uh, the architecture of the movement. Um, and it's no surprise that this you know, dial, this architecture of the skeleton movement is so brilliant uh, if you understand the corporate structure of the company. Design at Gerald Charles is led by a man named Octavio Garcia, who was a, a lead design at Audemars Piguet. So and I think that Audemars Piguet makes the best skeletons in the world. So it was no surprise to me after I saw this watch and was blown away by it, I said, there are so few people in the world that can actually make a skeleton this good, right? The list is very, very short. And uh, Audemars Piguet generally is most famous for having the people on that list. And Octavio Garcia just works with Gerald Charles. So it made perfect sense, right? I mean, they basically plucked a brilliant mind from the company that has done it to the greatest acclaim for decades. Anyway, I adore this watch. And I think it's just such an interesting chapter in the life of Gerald Genta, right? It was his last design. It is uh, poetically, you know, these are the last words of Gerald Genta. And I find that really, really interesting. Anyway, I'm really uh, proud of this watch. And I think that um, to understand watch history is to understand and Gerald Genta, and you don't uh, understand Gerald Genta until you right look at 
the the you know the collection of designs, right? Gerald Genta is best known for the Royal Oak and the Nautilus, but um, the man was far more brilliant, I think, than than just those two watches. So that's it. If you enjoyed today's episode, I know it was a long one, but if you enjoyed it, go ahead and uh, subscribe to our channel at Theo and Harris. And if you want more content from us, go ahead uh, down below and sign up for our Patreon at The Zero, where we can you know really speak uh, you know without filter. I've done unboxings uh, at nauseum of my personal watch collection over there. This watch when I got it, uh, my my green Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Um, there's such an amazing uh, collection of content over there and we release new episodes every week so I hope to see you on over there and um, and that's it get out of here <laughs>